Now this is an important thing to keep in mind. This is from the DSM-4 and I'll just read some of the important points here. In DSM-4 there is no assumption that each category of a mental disorder is a completely discrete entity with absolute boundaries dividing it from other mental disorders or from no mental disorder. There is no assumption that all individuals described as having the same mental disorder are alike in all important ways. This is a very important point because sometimes we get bogged down by diagnosis and you know we find it difficult to move from there. People don't come in nice categories. And especially in private practice, people present prodromally. And DSM-5 has a specific statement, says there will be patients who will not fulfill criteria but are still in need of treatment. So that's where understanding of neurophysiology, neuropharmacology, neuroanatomy becomes really important. A person might come just with severe sleep disturbances, just with cognitive problems impacting on their work. They might not be depressed, but they're having severe attention concentration difficulties impacting on their, on their work. So what, what do you do? So those are some of the questions that, might, that you might be confronted with. The specific diagnostic criteria included in DSM-4 are meant to serve as guidelines to be informed by clinical judgment and are not meant to be used in a cookbook fashion. Another very, very important point. And in relation to organic disorders, it should be recognized that these, which is mental disorder and general medical condition, that's my insertion, are merely terms of convenience and should not be taken to imply that there is any fundamental distinction between mental disorders and general medical conditions. So often what happens is we think organic or it should be somewhere else. It just doesn't work that way. There is a lot of organicity within existing mental health patients. In fact, uh, a, a review of studies done over 45 years, thousands of patients has shown approximately 27.1% of that group have organic disorders directly contributing to the psychopathology of the patient. So to give you an example, white matter hyperintensities in depression, in bipolar, you will see them very, very commonly. What does that tell you? Is there a possibility that this might be going down the path of vascular depression? And vascular depression is a different entity. Vascular depression could potentially go along the lines of vascular subcortical depression, vascular subcortical dementia. Right now it's called neurocognitive impairment. So you've got to think along the lines of foreseeability. So what does that mean? Where, where do we see white matter hyperintensities? You've probably heard of Binswanger's disease, which is a, a little bit more, you know, the leukoariosis bit. But the minor forms are seen all the time. You, you see males, hypertension, that's the Binswanger model. So males, hypertension. So hypertension needs to be treated. Is there cardiovascular stuff? Is aspirin needed? So all of these things are very, very important points. It's not just about the treatment of depression, but it's also other stuff. Remember, you're not only treating someone at one point, you're also preventing something else from happening in the future. So the checklist manifesto, and it's interesting because he talks about checklists, and you know that's where sort of I, I, I get the inspiration from. Because checklists make life easy. They really do. And he um, you know, uh, writes for the New York Times. He's an endocrine surgeon. And he talks about two types of errors. One is the error of ignorance, which nowadays we don't tend to succumb to because information is available everywhere. But it's the error of ineptitude that we succumb to quite a lot because it's how we use the information. It's the incorrect use of the information that we're most vulnerable to. So how do you really master your trade? You're doing two things. So most of the times we talk a lot about reducing errors. But remember, through those questions that I talked about earlier, you will improve insights because performance improvement is about doing both at the same time. You're constantly trying to ask yourself, well, why is this person not getting better? It's not about saying, okay, look, I've treated basic depression, fine. But why is this person not getting as well as they potentially could. What are the barriers? You know, are there organic barriers? Are there cognitive barriers? Are there social barriers, relationship barriers? All of those things one's got to think about. And he's, he says, we always hope for the easy fix, the one simple change that will erase a problem in a stroke. But few things in life work this way. Instead, success requires making a hundred steps go right, one after the other, no slip ups, no goofs, everyone pitching in. This becomes relevant in clinical practice because you will see often we assume that things have been done. 
So we say, oh, he's gone through the ED, therefore this should be ruled out. He's seen a neurologist, therefore that should have been done. Or he's seen, but go back, you know, take a few steps back and see if all that's done. And you'd be surprised with the kind of findings that you, you come up with. Because assumptions, you know, are, can be a real problem. We all assume that that's done, but sometimes things aren't done. You know, patients sometimes say, I had a scan. Did you have an MRI? Yeah, I had an MRI. You've got to be sure whether they've had an MRI, especially if you're considering even organic stuff, because if they've had a CT scan, it's not good enough, um, especially if there's a huge suspicion of organicity. And how would you, you know, know about MRI? When you were in the, in the scan, was there a really loud banging noise? Now, that's something that I remember. No. Okay. You, I'm thinking more CT then. You know, so because it's really, really important to know all of these things. It's about making sure clozapine becomes a really important thing. I, I see this a lot of times. So individuals might have had a clozapine related side effect. I had a patient um, who had clozapine stopped because of clozapine induced agranulocytosis. Okay. And he said, can I please go back on here? He was on four antipsychotics. I think it's depressidone, amisulpride. Uh, olanzapine plus one more. Four. And he's saying, can I please go back on clozapine? That was the best thing I ever had. I felt really good on it. He was on these four. Clozapine was stopped about three years ago. Okay. Going back through the notes, and this is really interesting, going back through the notes, about five years ago, he was diagnosed with possible epilepsy. And what do you think he was started on? Carbamazepine. So he was on clozapine before that for two years. We started on carbamazepine. So you, you can clearly see. Anyways, we successfully transitioned him to clozapine without any issues. And it's very, very important to keep that in mind. The second bit is benign neutropenia with clozapine. My consultant that I used to work with, Dr. Anir, he used to, with certain people, ask them to jog on the, uh, you know, just before the blood test. Run. Because benign neutropenia can be just because the actual neutrophils do not come into just because they sort of settle down. And it's, it's, it's a really amazing trick, but that's through clinical experience. You know? Um, so that's the other thing. Benign neutropenia can sometimes create a bit of a, a, a problem in clozapine treatment. So keep that in mind as well. So finally, you're thinking about strategy. As I mentioned before, it's a set of guiding principles which generates a roadmap for the clinician and his team to achieve a successful outcome for the patient. That's my made-up quote. Um, so strategic problem solving is really about what you're doing is first, and this is, again, a very important way of thinking. Define the outcome first. And what's the outcome? Recovery. Because when you start thinking about the outcome as recovery, you are going to start thinking differently. And we know that a lot of questions nowadays are based on recovery, recovery-oriented principles. There's even an OSCE on it. So, and it's highly likely to come up in the essay. In fact, in the essay, they've talked about individuals thinking about recovery as well in the marking scheme. So define the outcome. Your outcome should be recovery. Hope, empowerment, defined by the patient, going, vocational rehab, all of those things. So when you look at the inpatient that you're managing, Think about the management plan. You might not implement it because of the resources, um, but thinking about it will help you when the time comes for it. When you move into the community and you're looking after someone who's had schizophrenia for 20 years, for example. Okay. Next, identify problems. Like I said, problems, not just the diagnosis. Triangulate. That means getting information from different sources. Family, very, very important. They are, as they say, a family members' opinion can be disproved, but should never be ignored. Okay? Families know, you can get some really, really valuable information by, by listening to families. Analyze, hypothesize and prioritize your treatment and then implement. It's this prioritization that they're checking in your MEQs and your OCAs. What, how do you prioritize what are the most important things to do first? Not just a generic plan. And that's the whole thing. Textbooks do not provide that. Textbooks don't tell you how to prioritize. Textbooks give you information. They don't tell you how to implement it. Okay? 
Also remember what causality is, and this comes up in critical analysis. So when you're thinking about a partic two variables, you know, this person has had relationship difficulties and they've led to depression. So I had a patient, for example, 45-year-old male. Um, he, he was in the service, was having psychodynamic psychotherapy for four years. Not much improvement. He, uh, in, in the notes was written, relationship breakdown, depression. So the diagnosis was adjustment disorder with depressed mood. That's true causality, possibility. But always think reverse causality. What does that mean? Reverse causality means, is there something that is possibly happening that could have led to the relationship difficulties? Something here. And that's when you start thinking, okay, so with this person, there were a number of things. Firstly, sorry, he was about 51. Firstly, this was his first episode of depression at the age of 50. After 45, actually. So it was the first major episode of depression. What does that tell you? Late life depression, okay, organic component should be considered. First onset, right? And the most likely organic components in males are vascular aspects. Okay? So this person, through their history, cardiac bypass. Get a cardiac bypass. Now, cardiac, if someone's had cardiac bypass, it is highly likely they've had severe vascular involvement. Okay? Examination cognitively severely, severely impaired. So this person was kind of going downhill. What had happened? At the age of 40, he'd actually lost his business, lost his, then his relationship. So this may not be adjustment disorder, this could possibly be cognitive decline over time, leading to the current state. Okay? So he actually had even a severe intention tremor when actually doing testing. So not only finger nose testing, but Luria. Couldn't do it on one side because of severe. So frontal lobe testing becomes really important in someone like this because that's where the reverse causality comes in. It's asking you, hold on, could this be cognitive decline that's leading to all of these impacts on relationships, impacts on confounding? You start thinking about confounders, and confounders are vascular features. Has he had a head injury? Is alcohol involved? Those are confounders, other variables. Bias, and here the bias you're thinking about is your own bias because just diagnosing this individual of, with Adjustment disorder could be jumping to conclusions. And finally, you've got chance. This could just be a chance association. I could be completely wrong, but by thinking about these ways, I'm going to be ruling out everything. And the most common place where errors can happen is in drug and alcohol. Drug-induced psychosis. That's where you have to think about the reverse causality. Could this, be, could this person be using drugs to self-medicate something? And that's where you tease out whether the disorder is present. Because, and that's why all drug and alcohol cases should be addressed in a dual diagnosis approach. And that's a recommendation as well. What does dual diagnosis mean? It actually means true causality or reverse causality. Take everything into account. Take both sides of the equation. Chicken and egg both. Okay? So medicine is a science of uncertainty, art of probability. So think in terms of probabilities. There's never one single conclusive diagnosis. Okay? Formulation matrix, this is what you're thinking of. You're thinking of the etiological factors, consequential factors, and speculative factors. So speculative factors basically means the evidence isn't there, but based on your experience pattern, you know that this may be a, a factor. So for example, there's no evidence of organicity, but I know that the first episode of depression at the age of 55, organicity needs to be disproven. Okay. So those sorts of things are speculative. Consequential is this person is on high dose antipsychotic. This person is having cogwheel rigidity. Cognitive impairment as well, frontal lobe. The, con the possible consequence of this is on vocational rehabilitation. Right? That's the consequential hypothesis. Because what you've got to do then is to make sure that this person minimizes cognitive impairment. Because remember, your aim is recovery. It's quite easy to treat psychotic uh, symptoms through high dose antipsychotics. You block limbic system dopamine, but you're going to block frontal dopamine. That's what will help with recovery, frontal dopamine. So you've got to achieve a balance. Okay? Um, and think about biopsychosocial cultural, and then you think about maintaining factors, think about strengths. This is really what you use in your case histories as well. Okay? And then finally, your management of mental disorders. And this is really helpful for you to start thinking already. 
prioritization of mental disorders. First, think about risk management and setting. You know, what are the risks here? And is the setting appropriate for this person to be managed? Second, clarify the diagnosis through information gathering. Third, treatment of the symptoms. And that's what we, you know, most individuals do quite well. So we know what the treatment is, but do a risk-benefit analysis. You then think of long-term treatment. Long-term treatment is relapse prevention, drug and alcohol relapse prevention, and psychosocial rehabilitation, which is think about relationships, accommodation, finances, and vocation. Then you think about barriers to implementation. What are the barriers in, that my, I might come across to, whilst I'm implementing this plan? And finally, prognosis. So prognosis, short-term, which is responsive treatment, long-term, which means relapse probability. Now this is something you can start thinking with every case. In fact, what I tended to do with my registrars, especially where we could have ward rounds or case conferences, because I think they're very important. So when you're a consultant, something you can use. I used to write these up on the board, so the uh, registrar used to present cases this way. And it, you can see it covers everything. It's a great checklist. And it helps with learning, helps with discussion, Overall, a nice way of having a ward run as well, okay? And it takes five minutes. Lastly, you have the OSCE. I'll just have a quick look at the time again. Coming to the end. So what you've got here is, the OSCEs are set in the following way. So they think about a component curriculum. And what is it here? For example, psychotic spectrum disorder. Condition. So they'll say, okay, we're going to test psychotic spectrum disorders, we're going to test schizophrenia. Next, what skill do we test? Communication. So it could be assessment, it could be whatever, but here, so let's say communication. Lastly, what framework are we going to put that in? So they would say, communicate the diagnosis of schizophrenia to a worried mother of a 19-year-old. That's how the OSCEs are set. So you've got to start thinking about this when you can see you can substitute anything, child and adolescent, condition, ADHD, skill, psychoeducation, to family member. Framework, you can form whatever. So here they might add a layer where the, the, the mom's really uh, angry. So worried mother, angry mother. So in the particular scenario, she stands up, and this was in my CASC exam and my MRC psych exam. She stands up, gets really angry, shouldn't be under the mental health act, all of that. So part of it is pacifying the mother as well. Saying, if, if you have any concerns, I completely understand, I acknowledge where you're coming from, it's a very, very difficult scenario, but we can assure you that we're acting in the best interest of your, of your son. If you do, we, we, you know, if you're concerned, you want to make complaints, you're unhappy about the treatment, I can provide advice on how to do that as well. You know? So it's about, and these are the, some of the checklists, and these are some of the things that you practice repeatedly so that you, you're confronted with these scenarios and you, you know how to manage them. Thank you.